uh, be something sufficiently appealing to give an everyday account of what success would feel like to citizens right across the UK. The narrative, the storytelling account of what levelling up really means. But they need also to serve as a clear and quantitative anchor for policy, a yardstick for policy. And the way we sought to serve that double duty is by defining levelling up in terms of a set of 12 uh, medium-term uh, missions. Let me uh, flash them up. That's pretty small print, don't worry uh, about that. I'm not going to navigate through blow by blow. To su suffice to say, these 12 missions are intended to capture the very essence, the raw ingredient of what it takes to be successful in levelling up. Um, from rising living standards and longevity to improving education and skills, from boosting connectivity, uh, both physical and digital, to improved housing, to restoring pride in place, to boosting well-being and happiness. These are the raw ingredients of the recipe. And as with a cake recipe, you need each and every one of those raw ingredients to make a successful levelling up uh, case. Although these are specified in often quite precise numeric terms, in essence, in essence, what the missions are seeking to achieve is a turning of the tide, a reversal of the spatial disparities that have been large and widening in the UK since around uh, the Second World War. A turning of the tide, if you like, a reversing of what have been centrifugal forces separating places and turning them instead into centripetal forces that pushes places uh, together. This mission-led approach has pretty impeccable historical and practical foundations, often dating back to JFK's 1962 mission to put a man, and he did say a man, on the moon uh, by the end of the decade. And these missions for levelling up have some of the self-same features. They too are about uh, galvanising action across actors, public and private and civic, over a long-term uh, horizon. And they also serve as a yardstick for government uh, policy, something for which the government can be held to account in the same way as it's held to account, for example, for a net zero mission when it comes to climate change or a 2% inflation target mission when it comes to my old gig uh, setting uh, monetary policy. So that then is what it is set out in clear everyday language and in clear quantitative terms against which government can then be held to account. If that's what it is, um, what are the benefits from making good on uh, those missions of reversing, turning that spatial uh, tide? Well, if I go back to the 18th century to Dr. Johnson, if you recall his quote, he saw levelling up as some distributional struggle between North and South or rich and poor. Indeed, some of the commentary around levelling up now has some of those features uh, as well. Now, what I, want, what I want to say to you is that I think that way of conceiving of levelling up is fundamentally, fundamentally wrong and indeed wrong-headed because at root for me, levelling up is not about how the pie is sliced, but rather about growing the totality of that pie. It's about unlocking opportunity and realising potential among all people and in uh, all places. I can say that with a degree of confidence because if you boil it down, levelling up is about tackling not one but two uh, distinctive uh, market failures, each of which is holding back both people and place. And let me mention both of those in turn. 
Now, the first market failure, the one that will be familiar to everyone in this room, is one that afflicts places that are struggling, places that are falling behind the post-industrial parts of the Midlands and North, those coastal towns, the stranded towns and rural retreats that exist across all four corners of the UK, they are locked in a slow and slow growth trap. That is the market failure afflicting them. And if you could spring that trap, that would realise a bigger pie for people in those places. There's a second market failure, less familiar, I imagine, and that arises even in places indeed especially in places that aren't falling behind, but are instead uh, steaming ahead. Some of the most successful cities, including here in London. And the particular affliction or cost they face includes overpriced and overcongested housing, overpriced and overcongested transport pollution, absence of green spaces, and ultimately, the way that shows up in low levels of happiness and well-being. Although London is right at the top of the UK league table when it comes to pay and productivity, it is right at the bottom of the league table when it comes to levels of life uh, satisfaction. Something that this graphic looks at the kind of map of pay and life satisfaction, in some ways they are the mirror image of one another, uh, making uh, this uh, very point. And that tells us that the UK's regional disparities are bad news, whether you are rich or poor, north or south, cities or those stranded towns, correcting, reversing those disparities would deliver uh, a two-sided benefit. It would correct two sets of market failures and therefore deliver a twin win for both falling behind and for steaming ahead places. Which begs the question, um, how big is that twin win? How big are those uh, benefits? Well, uh, in that paper I mentioned, uh, coming soon, uh, I go through blow by blow, mission by mission, and attempt to estimate, calibrate the per period benefits in pounds billion from making good on each of those missions you'd almost see on screen a few minutes ago in very small print. Um, and this gives you some illustrative estimates of the extent uh, of those gains. They range from the well worth having in other words, single-digit billions of pounds, for example, from improved crime and connectivity, right through to the truly uh, transformative, that would say, tens or even perhaps hundreds of billions of pounds when it comes to levelling up uh, lifespans uh, and levels uh, of happiness. And here's the real key point. Because you are correcting market failures, because you are unlocking potential, those benefits aren't one-off. They aren't temporary. They are permanent. They are long-lived. And therefore, the all-in benefits of levelling up are the accumulation of these per-period gains uh, over time. And if you make some plausible-ish assumptions about discounting the future, what you find is that the, the net present value, the accumulation of those discounted benefits could be very large uh, indeed. Uh, bottom slide here, those NPV benefits could be at least equivalent uh, to a year or perhaps two years of annual UK GDP. Between two and a half and five trillion pounds to turn that into uh, pounds uh, and pence. I'm sure you'd agree those are pretty big numbers. I'm sure you'd agree uh, that is a prize uh, well worth having. Which takes us on to the question then of how best 
uh, that prize is to be seized. Now, uh, the UK has not lacked for attempts to put in place regional policies that would harvest these benefits. They have come thick and fast over the last 70 years, and of course therein lies the key to failure, because policies that are short-lived have no chance of correcting what are long-lived and deeply entrenched uh, spatial disparities, which begs the question, what should give us confidence, therefore, that this time is different, that the tide this time can definitively uh, be turned, that the Polish regime in the white paper will stand the test of time in a way that has not been true of its predecessors. Well, ultimately, ultimately, what matters here are not the details of policy, but the very fundamentals of the way the system functions, the very fundamentals of both how and indeed where decisions are taken. It's about changing the information available to decision makers. It's about changing the incentives facing those decision makers. And it's also about the institutions within which those decisions are taken. And what the white paper did was seek to change at source in the system those three eyes information, incentives, and institutions. And let me mention two or three ways in which it sought to do uh, just that. First, the missions. What the missions provide is a clear, quantitative north star for policy against which policy can be assessed uh, rigorously and transparency. That, I think, will sharpen very materially the incentives placed on current and indeed future governments. They then have an obligation to comply with the mission, to remain on the critical path, or to explain their reasons uh, not so for doing. And those missions will be enshrined uh, in statute with a company statutory obligation to report on progress against them on an annual basis, giving extra teeth and ideally extra longevity to the regime. That's one feature, I think, reshaping incentives and altering decision-making. And that will be uh, accompanied by further measures that will reshape decision-making too. Well, people ask me, uh, Andy, can you give me uh, a one-sentence description of this 375-page magnum opus? I said, yes, I can, and this is it. What the white paper is, in essence, is a new model of government and a new model of governance. So let me unwrap and unpick those two statements uh, for you. A new model of government. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that we need nothing more and nothing less than a fundamental rewiring of the Whitehall uh, machine, a rewiring that puts spatial considerations, regional considerations, local cons considerations front and centre when decisions are taken by each and every Whitehall uh, department. That hasn't been the case. That hasn't been the case in the past. One of my uh, learnings from the past six months is that Whitehall has one very clear similarity uh, with my dog, and that's that both have a distinct lack of spatial awareness. Uh, in Whitehall's case, that often reflects a simple lack of data. Government departments can't tell you what their geographic footprint uh, looks like. In others, it's because monies have been directed in places that are already doing well. Think of transport spend, think of culture spend, think of R&D spend, a version of the kind of Matthew effect where success pursues further success. So if we are to turn the tide on regional disparities, we can make a good start by turning the tide on how government itself spends its money, with more of it going towards places that are doing less well and away uh, from the centres. That process has begun. 
not least through a weekly cabinet committee meeting. We might come to more of that in the discussion. Second, the new model of governance. What do I mean by that? Well, by that I mean um, what will actually be a pretty fundamental reorientation of decision making away from the centre and towards local leaders. And by local leaders, I don't just mean local government. I mean, as importantly, the private sector, that is to say, local businesses. And I mean civil society, by which I mean local community groups uh, and charities. Truth be told, truth be told, the heavy lifting of levelling up won't be done by central government alone. It perhaps won't even be done by central government mainly. It will come. It will come from empowering and enabling local leaders, public, private and civic, whose local knowledge and local agency holds the secret source to levelling up success. So for local government, this does mean pressing ahead with the next phase of devolution. The white paper signalled and signposted that. Nine new county deals, two new mayoral combined authorities, nine million more people taking local control over their destiny. And if the devolution mission that I showed you a few minutes ago were to be made good on, what that would mean is that by 2030, every part of the UK that wants a devolution deal can have one, with powers at or approaching London levels. If that came to pass, that truly would be a transformation in the governance of the UK, the biggest shift in powers, decentralisation powers, in the UK for well over uh, a century. Just as importantly, though, however, the, the white paper signposted a shift in decision making towards communities at the hyper local level and towards the private sector. So, for local communities, that means greater powers and greater monies being held very locally what sometimes goes by the name of not devolution, but double devolution. And for the private sector, for the private sector, when I travel around the UK uh, and visit places, I'm often bowled over by the pockets of dynamism and brilliance I see within business and within our universities and our colleges. They are the very wellspring of good job, good wages, high skills and high productivity. In other words, they are the wellspring of making good on levelling up. So success in levelling up means having that industrial strategy in place to catalyse those embryonic clusters of business activity uh, and to nurture those pre-existing clusters of activity, if you like, to turn those clusters into genuine superclusters, spanning larger geographies and larger numbers of sectors. And doing that, doing that is going to require a shift not just in policy, but in the very philosophy behind policy with less central command and control and far greater empowerment of local Actors. Let me wrap up so we have a chance for some discussion. There, of course, inevitably are loads of open questions about what happens next, not least because what I'm signposting here through the white paper is not a change in policy as much as a change in the philosophy underlying that policy. I've illustrated uh, in this slide a few places where there's a further debate to be had about the shape that levelling up uh, takes. We might pick up some of these in our discussion. Suffice to say, though, that on the basis of my discussions since the publication of the White Paper with literally hundreds of people, the one clear message they have all conveyed is that the White Paper provides a basis for planning and a basis for proceeding. Not a guarantor of success, but the right platform for that success. One thing is for sure, without any doubt, and that's that the stakes here, the stakes economically, uh, the stakes socially, 
and indeed the stakes politically uh, could scarcely uh, be higher. If nothing else, I hope what I've set out and my opening remarks speak to that. Let me step, stop there and, and pass the floor across to Anna. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Andy, and thank you for giving us a sneak preview of your new paper, which I'm sure everyone here will enjoy reading. Um, two months on from the white paper, you mention yourself, there are certain developments, cabinet committee going on. I mean, where are we at? Where are we on levelling up? And where, from your insights into what is happening in the heart of government, are they at? Yeah, I think we've seen... Um I think we've seen uh, good progress. It, it's early days. Two months is definitely uh, early days. Um, but some of the machinery of government uh, has already been changed in a fairly fundamental way. I mentioned the weekly cabinet uh, committee. That was occurring in, in the run-up to the white paper. It's a means by which you can get round the table uh, ministers from all government departments. And that's key because if you are to do effective placemaking, you need all the arms of government to be pulling together uh, in a coordinated fashion in one direction. So, for example, uh, when I was still in government um, a few weeks ago, we had our first deep dive on a place. Uh, the place was Blackpool. Uh, and that was an opportunity to one stock take on where Blackpool had reached. But secondly, and, and more purposefully, to have a structured conversation of what, about what Blackpool now needs. What it needs from central government in a coordinated fashion, involving those ministers. And also, as importantly, what Blackpool needs locally, by way of local leaders, whether governmental, private sector, or civil society leaders. So that's a conversation, that's a plan, in this case for Blackpool, that would not have existed without this new machinery of government. Anyone that tells you that the answer to any problem is a cabinet committee is obviously pulling your leg. Nonetheless, machinery matters, and some of that machinery is now in place. OK. And you were then, just to uh, spell out to the audience, you were still in government until two weeks ago. So, yes, two months is a short amount of time, but also we've seen such a huge shift in geopolitics, um, the economy, pretty much every facet of life, cost of living. How have these things, war in Europe, um, rising inflation, how did that impact the work on levelling up up until recently? Did, did you see a shift? Um, not a discernible one. Uh, I mean, it's true that you know, when news events come along, and we've had incredible... Uh, incredibly bad news events uh, over that period. Uh, of course, there's, there's less talk of some of the longer-term structural challenges, which levelling up is plainly one. Uh, nonetheless, let's take a, one aspect of that, the cost of living crisis. Do I think that has had the effect of putting levelling up uh, on the back burner? Do I think that's caused uh, levelling up to move down the inbox uh, of politicians and policymakers. No, I don't. Because we know, I think, quite a lot about how the burden of that cost of living crisis will pan out. It will hit hardest. Uh, there's people uh, and there's places uh, desperately in need of levelling up. So although the cost of living crisis will tighten budgets for everyone, for governments, for businesses, uh, for households, which will make the challenge harder. It's also the case that that cost of living crisis in increases the imperative of levelling up in the first place. So my sense is that far from diminishing the focus on all matters levelling up, economically, socially, politically, the cost of living crisis will amplify those concerns and up the importance of making good on the plans set out. Well, interesting, and I mean, you mentioned earlier as well, you want to grow the pie, not just slice it up. What happens, though, when the pie is eaten up by inflation? 
how do we, going forward, especially from your background in the Bank of England, um, what do you think are the ways to t tackle that? Because not only does that affect households, like you say, but of course every single government department with every single budget will have that eaten up as well. Yeah, yeah. A couple of points on that then, uh, Anna, if I may. Uh, I mean, first of all, um, these are uh, medium to long-term missions. Uh, and that's me, that means success in meeting those missions uh, will not and should not be defined um, by the current fiscal envelope. There will be multiple uh, spending review events uh, before those missions are realised. Multiple bites of the cherry. Uh, and therefore, even if the, the fiscal space today is somewhat diminished, that doesn't necessarily go for fiscal events down the line, point one. Point two, and I think this one's even more important, uh, is that we should not uh, look to public monies and indeed public policies uh, as the only or perhaps even the main means by which we are successful in living up the country. The actions of the private sector, the mobilization of private sector monies are for me every bit as important, if not more important, when it comes to success. So rather than just asking the question, how much extra public money is being put in, to which the answer is a lot, by the way, uh, as important, in some ways, a more important question is, what is that public money doing to crowd in private monies? So the truth is the pool of private money right now, both national and international, is enormous. If even a tiny sliver of that private pool of capital can be redirected into struggling places across the UK, that could be truly transformative. So in the white paper we talk about, for example, the pool of money held uh, by local government pension funds. That's slightly north of 300 billion pounds. Almost none of that money currently is invested in local projects. If even a tiny sliver, and we asked for 5% of those monies, would be thought about being deployed on local projects, that would deliver a pot, several multiples of the government's current levelling up fund. And if you went from local government pension schemes to the totality of private sector pension funds, you go from 300 billion to a number closer to 3 trillion pounds, very little of any of which currently is deployed in local projects. A tweak on the tiller there could be truly transformative for the amount of money going to support levelling up. So... The public lens is an important lens, but it's not the only lens and may not even be the most important lens when it comes to making good on this. So yes, cash is tighter than we thought a few months ago, but then in some ways ups the ante on finding alternative ways of making ends meet, including the private sector. Well, and two things there. So firstly, future fiscal events. Um, we are in 2022. Obviously, your vision is almost for the next decade. But were you disappointed with the spring statement where the Chancellor has been very clear that for the rest of the Parliament, there's going to be no more upping any government budgets? That's number one on the fiscal side. And then on the private investment side, how do you, in this current environment where confidence is probably going to take a hit, um, how do you encourage that investment? And how do you also encourage it in the places that will help levelling up most? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not going to uh, do Rishi's job for him. Um, doesn't need my help in doing a tough job. Um, on the private sector investment side, I think this is absolutely crucial. We've gone through a period since the global financial crisis of an investment uh, drought, uh, not just locally but globally. Uh, a, a whole set of reasons for that. Um, I think the most obvious is that we've had successive waves of uncertainties. We know that uncertainty is a surefire investment killer. If you're a business thinking of undertaking CapEx, 
you will press the pause button if the, inf if the future looks very foggy in terms of demand. And the truth is, for the last 12 years or so, the demand outlook has been very foggy, resulting first from the global financial crisis and a very sluggish and anemic recovery from it. Then, of course, uh, the cloud of uncertainty thrown up uh, by Brexit, both the run-up to and the direction of uh, Brexit. That's not a subjective statement. That's what surveys of business told us was the case. And thirdly, of course, then came along a third cloud of uncertainty in the form of COVID. All of those were very good reasons to press the pause button on private investment. I mean, the good news uh, is that the three clouds that I've mentioned... I hope, fingers crossed, touching wood, if I could see any, uh, are now beginning to lift, they are now beginning to dissipate. It's true that some other uncertainties have come on stream, most obviously uh, geopolitically and the cost of uh, living uh, crisis. Uh, but nonetheless, I do think, I do hope, that if geopolitical concerns uh, were, I hope, to begin to dissipate, uh, that, that would provide a, a degree of support for companies getting back to business when it comes to investing uh, after a long period uh, of drought. And I do think there are things that can be done fiscally, policy-wise, and beyond to encourage uh, businesses to get back to the pump when it comes to investment. So like what? Any, any examples? Well, we've seen uh, the Chancellor already encouraging this through the super deduction. Um, I think that directionally is, uh, is very helpful. Um, that comes to an end. There's a question about whether uh, that might be continued uh, or not. Um, I think uh, when it comes to the broader business environment, comes to the broader business environment, um, there's lots that can be done right now to, to dampen down uncertainties of various types. So the stuff that there can be done by business, by policymakers, to get us back on track investment-wise, because ultimately that's what you need to drive, not just growth, uh, but productivity in the economy. We'll go to questions in a second, but um, the white paper, all 300 pages, obviously was extraordinary in its breadth and, um, uh, in, in, in just how many facets of life it touched across the country. Everything from life expectancy to education. I mean, you in your six months overseeing all of this, was there something that was particularly eye-catching in the work that, or eye-opening to you um, in the way, it, you know, it, it, around the country from this that really stood out? Well, in some ways, you know, my work on this has began uh, when I was about 13 years old, to be honest. So um, that was the early 80s. That's how old I am. Um, the UK was going through at that time not a wrenching... Not like Samuel Johnson time. But... Not, not yet. No, no. Um, he, he beat me to it. The, uh, the UK was going through a wrenching recession. Uh, regional disparities were, were large and widening. Uh, so this is a, a topic of long-standing interest to me, Personally, I spent several years prior to COVID uh, wandering around the UK, uh, exploring the places that weren't working well and asking why they weren't working well. And it was clear from those conversations uh, with local people um, that um, this was a complex needs case. There wasn't one single thing that could ever explain why a place was doing badly. And that's why, you know, in the missions that I mentioned earlier on, we set out a whole range of factors that need to go right for a place to go right. It wasn't just about the finances, not just about jobs and incomes, businesses. It's also about health, both physical and mental. It's also about connectivity, both physical and digital. It is about social capital, about trust and relationships, something particularly important during the COVID crisis. Um, it is about agency, about leadership, about being the master of your own destiny, of having the capacity and capability to make decisions for yourself in your local area. It is that complex blend of factors, and that's why the prognosis in the white paper is itself quite complex. 
and why the prescription in the white paper is also quite long uh, and uh, complex. And we did signal in that a pretty rudimentary, a pretty fundamental shift in how we think about the, the raw ingredients of success, the raw ingredients of growth. It isn't all about financials, social factors, cultural factors, leadership factors are every bit as important when it comes to making a success of leveling up. And that was a decisive philosophical shift from where I think any government of any hue has been at any point in the past. Great. Well, hopefully we can move to the audience now. We've also got questions coming in online. So, who would like to go first? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name's Paul Atherton. I'm a fellow here. Um, I think I'd like to ask Andy because what you've described to me seems very much based on an entrepreneurial spirit being reignited back in Britain, akin possibly to, to what we did in the 80s with sort of things like Cardiff and Vale Enterprises and encouraging people to set up their own businesses. Um, is that how you see this working? And if so, how do you change the attitude that seems currently prevalent in Britain of being incredibly averse to risk and encouraging both investment and the populace to take responsibility for their own actions? And let's go, there's a lady at the back as well, we can do that. Hi, um, Marie Williams, CEO of Dream Networks and also a fellow of RSA. So I've got a question, I'm going to read it out <laughs> to make it, ensure it's coherent. In relation to the point you raised around increasing the pie across the UK, particularly in the diverse places in the UK, how do you envisage true double devolution actually practically taking place and provide the agency to local leaders? And more specifically, what language and routes should we actually be using to ensure that the local leaders in these underserved or maybe struggling or potentially disenfranchised, disenfranchised communities are able to engage in this level up mission and actually enable their stories to turn the hands of the private sector, recognising the private sector are often moved by stories and culture and place. And there's a question online from Margaret Dale that fits in with that theme. Where do local authorities and particularly local councillors fit into this model? Very good. Should we, should we pick those up, Anna, uh, in turn? I mean, to Paul's point, I mean, you're right, Paul, that I think um, uh, success in levelling up, indeed success in driving growth, um, will require a degree of risk-taking, of uh, entrepreneurialism. Now, often entrepreneurialism is, is uh, seen to be associated exclusively with the private sector, and that is not how I see it at all. I think that spirit of um, frontier pushing, of risk taking, uh, uh, ought to apply every bit as much within the public sector, whether locally or centrally, if you like the entrepreneurial state, to borrow the uh, expression used by Mariana Mazzucato, and also within civil society, uh, and its many and various uh, shapes uh, and forms and you know my, my preferred model of development which is by no means a new model of development it's a model of development we've seen in place since at least the industrial revolution is where we see uh, the public sector the private sector and civil society uh, each individually stepping up uh, and acting ambitiously and entrepreneurially in a risk-taking fashion but also cushioning the risks that they face individually by operating in partnership. This is a model I think that we saw uh, play out brilliantly at the time of the vaccine development, where the state served in an entrepreneurial fashion by de-risking some of the projects that were being undertaken by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and the voluntary sector stepped up in ensuring that those vaccines once developed found their way into people's uh, arms. That was entrepreneurialism extended well beyond the private sector to include the state and civil society too. And for me, that is um, the secret source, has been the secret source of success historically when it comes to growth and levelling up and all of the things bright and beautiful and will be the same uh, recipe for success looking forward. 
to, was it, was, it, was it Juliet? I didn't quite catch your, was it Juliet? Marie. Marie, sorry, I wasn't even close, was it with Juliet? <laughs> um, um, uh, your, your excellent question about you know, double devolution and how to make a success uh, of, uh, of that. In some ways, we can, we can seek inspiration here from what happens internationally. You know, um, UK PLC really is to one end of the spectrum, extreme end of the spectrum, when it comes to the existing degree of, uh, of centralization of both powers uh, and monies. So we can look to other models around the world of how to make good uh, in decentralizing. What the white paper commits to is a set of pilots uh, of community empowerment uh, we were clear in that white paper that those pilots, when they take place, should absolutely not be either designed or delivered by central government. The right place for have, to have those designed and delivered is, of course, at the hyper-local community level. My hope would be, looking forward from now, those pilots will be put into place, we'll evaluate those pilots and then build on them in a way that leads to that much greater degree of uh, local community level uh, empowerment. I think to your point about wide engagement, one of the things we committed to um, uh, in chapter four, if you'd reached that stage, of the white paper was a fundamentally different approach to engagement off the back of the white paper, not drive-by consultation. Here's your 375 pages, read it and weep but rather an ongoing commitment to consult and engage, including through citizens' panels uh, on the levelling up uh, agenda. So that those, some of those often uh, quieter voices in local communities are engaged with and heard, and those voices in ultimately are acted, uh, acted uh, on. And then to Margaret, I think it was Margaret, um, to her question, um, I mean, in terms of uh, local authorities and local councillors, um, their role under this general direction of travel is going to become even more important, uh, with more powers and more monies pushed down from the central to local level, then they will play an even more important role. Truth be told, right now, if you look across the UK, if you travel around the UK, then uh, levels of capacity and capability at the local authority level are quite mixed. Uh, so alongside all the other things that we invest in and seek to build, we need absolutely to build that capacity and capability and leadership potential at the local level. We spent 50 years running down civic institutions. Now's the time to step up and invest in them. Let's take three more questions. Okay, lady, uh, second row. Hi, Andy. Barbara Camanti, uh, UK Research and Innovation. Um, I totally uh, agree with you on uh, leveraging investment from the uh, private sector and the industry. And I would just wonder, I mean, at this point, the interplay and the role of government, because also a central government as well, in securing this investment, there should be all this kind of work done on building, creating and building uh, innovation ecosystems and uh, connectivity, digital connectivity infrastructure. And if I'm thinking at um, um, digital uh, technologies, disruptive technology like artificial intelligence or digital twins, I mean, we will never be able to match investment from places like uh, United States or China and so on. But if you want to be a player in that area and really leveraging uh, investment in that area, how do you see government position in itself uh, and uh, with your experience in the past six months, uh, where do you see government standing on this one? Thank you. And then there's a gentleman there, hand raised now. Thank you. Robert Shaw, fellow. I wanted to just see if uh, there is any historic, if there's any historic uh, template or examples of uh, where we've seen successful placemaking. Uh, it could be here uh, or anywhere in the world. 
uh, where the arts, manufacturing, science have combined and had the effect of uh, ending the brain drain or diminishing crime, reducing inequality, increasing prosperity, improving local health outcomes, or raising even the aesthetic or material value of a town or a city or region. Let's take on from this section, gentlemen, at the end. Uh, can I just explore on our devolved governance? I mean, that would suggest certainly for a highly centralised country that we really devolve the budgets and the money. Um, and you touched a bit on that, but did you do any work as part of the white paper to explore what that means over a 10 year period? How much more money would be seriously transferred from the treasury control and coffers to local levels at whatever local level, but outside of the control of the treasury? And there's a question online from John Latham. How do this um, compare to previous attempts for example, Blair New, Blair's New Deal for Communities. Very good. Um, thank you for those. So, so taking them in turn then, um, uh, on Barbara, um, absolutely this is about taking, for me, what are the current 30, 40 um, existing or embryonic clusters of fantastic activity and seeking means of growing them. Um, and the language I used to turn those clusters into superclusters, lots of means by which that might be brought about. Um, it does call for something that is definably an industrial strategy. Uh, those words sometimes stick in the crawl, but ultimately that's what we're talking about. Plan beats no plan. Uh, and a plan on this is uh, needed. It also requires this is the point I was trying to make in my opening remarks, um, a different way of operating by government, right? So the ask of a place, the ask of a cluster, if you go around and visit them, I've visited many, many of them, is often quite different. You know, for some, they do require a slither of public money to de-risk the project and to crowd in private financing. In other cases, the ask is actually not financial. It's that there are, that there are blockers there are barriers, there are regulations, there are planning restrictions that need removing to catalyze action and make stuff happening. In other places, again, the ask isn't about monies and isn't about barriers. It's purely about convening and coordinating local actors. This is a different way, a different philosophy of doing governance. Uh, and ultimately, I think that's what we need to nurture uh, the sort of clusters that you've been working on, Barbara, in your previous, uh, in your previous work. And ultimately, is the, the route to job creation and uh, skills and productivity and pay uh, growth. To, to Robert's question, um, I think, um, and we've studied this, uh, in, in, uh, I've studied this in various guises over many years, there are plenty of historical examples of success on this front. There are many more of failure, by the way. Nonetheless, there are enough examples of success to know quite a lot about uh, what is needed. Uh, and it's pretty obvious stuff, actually. It's having a plan. It's sticking with the plan uh, over periods measured in decades rather than years. It's having a plan uh, that joins the dots uh, between the different policy arms, transport and health uh, and business uh, and local government and education uh, and skills. We see examples of that across the UK already. So if you drive up to Manchester, one of the reasons why Manchester has been a success story, it's made a success of, um, uh, of its devolution plan, is one because uh, it was being done well ahead of Andy Burnham arriving as mayor. Um, so Howard Bernstein and Richard Lees spent several decades before the mayoral combined authority came into play in building the foundations and joining together those different moving parts that I mentioned earlier on. Interestingly, it's much easier to coordinate policy at the local level than it is 
at the national level. Andy Burnham can coordinate transport and health and schools in a way it's pretty tough to do across the different Whitehall departments. So I think absolutely there's a recipe there that's been followed in some places internationally and indeed is being followed to some extent in some places nationally and now needs rolling out right across uh, the UK. Its raw ingredients are the ones that I mentioned just a second uh, ago. I missed your name, or perhaps you didn't even mention it. Chris. Thank you, um, uh, Chris. Um, you raised some uh, very good questions about um, transfers of powers uh, and transfers of uh, monies. Now, truth be told, um, in the white paper, we said quite a lot about transfers, and I'll lean forward so I can see you, uh, of money, of powers, and far less about transfers of money. It's very little in the white paper was said about tax raising powers uh, for local areas. It was all about spending powers for local areas. And that, for me, uh, means that we've only really reached halfway at best in the debate we need to have in this country about devolution. Uh, because ultimately, that's not just about decentralizing powers to spend but also about decentralizing powers uh, to tax. If you do one without the other, see what happens. You get an ever-rising chorus of demands of central government for financing. That's what will happen off the back of a greater number of deeper devolution deals. And that rising chorus of discontent can only be beaten back by going the second mile. That is to say, by beginning to, to think about allowing local areas to finance themselves by raising local taxes. Ultimately, that's what aligns incentives. If you're not to have these mayors saying, thanks very much for the billion, but we'd quite like an extra billion for our hospital or school or railway station. Uh, if you're not to get yourself in a endless arm wrestle on those decisions. You say, fine, if you, Andy, to pick a name at random, uh, do want that extra hospital or school or railway station, you raise the money yourself through taxation and you justify that decision to your local electorate. That's what aligns the incentives. And that's why the second part of this debate is important to get going uh, before uh, too long. A debate that has yet to fully surface. Finally, to John's online question about you know, how does uh, this differ uh, from things in the past, for me this goes uh, to the question of you know, what are we doing to durably change not just policies, but the way in which decisions are made as a policy uh, matter. Unless you are reshaping the information on which decisions are taken, the incentives shaping those decisions, or the institutions within which those decisions are being embedded, then nothing will durably change. And I hope what's in the white paper is enough of all three of those to make uh, that durable and lasting change. I think we've got time for one more pithy question. Who's, who's feeling pithy? <laughs> That's pithy, um, by the way. The lady, the lady in front. Hi, thanks, Andy. Sonia Madden, RSA Fellow. Um, so I, I love everything that you've said. It all makes infinite amount of sense. Um, as we all know, ideas are cheap. Execution is what matters. Yeah. Adoption is what matters. Yeah. My question is this. Given that this is a conservative government initiative, what do your friends on the other side of the aisle think of it? And how likely do you think this is to run the length and get to 2030 with all of those accomplishments that you've laid out? Yeah, great. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for that, Sonia. Um, so, let me end. This is the last, last, last question, yeah? Last question. Then let me end We've optimistically. Been strict on time. Because we need to be optimistic. Um, so let me give you some. Um, I am very confident this agenda uh, is going to be taken forward. Um, uh, and why do I say that? We have at the moment uh, a fortunate uh, alignment of the stars. 
we have an agenda here, leveling up, that is uh, economically sensible, efficient. I've given some estimates of, of the sort of economic gains, and they are whopper. They are whopper, right? Who would not want to harvest gains on that scale? Of course you would. It so happens that what is economically efficient is also the socially just thing to be doing, right? This speaks exactly to issues of social justice, of opportunities not being equally or fully harvested across the whole of the UK. So you have an agenda that is economically efficient and big in its impact, an agenda that is socially uh, just and needed. And finally, the third star in alignment is the political star. This is also an agenda that is politically expedient. So I would absolutely expect, hope and expect, each and every political party to get behind this, whatever words they use to get behind this. And indeed, my optimistic ending here, my hope, would be that we see the main political parties competing for virtue. Imagine that. Um, <laughs> when it comes to this agenda, playing a game of political leapfrog when it comes to the speed and the seriousness with which they go about it. If the white paper is the prompt, is the catalyst uh, for that competition for virtue on this agenda, then my work is done. Brilliant. Thank you, Andy. And I feel like competing for virtue... Competing for virtue is an excellent note to end it on for both the RSA, this room we're in, um, and our excellent audience with their very insightful questions. So thank you all for coming. Thank you to the RSA for hosting. And this is one of several events, so I think those who could not get their question in both online and here will have more chances to do so. Thanks very much.